All right, some people are joining in. 15, 16 is going up. All right, welcome. Welcome everyone for people joining in. Good afternoon, welcome everyone. Okay, we have 33 participants already. Excellent, excellent, 77, okay, 38. All right, let's start. Um, welcome, welcome everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. We're gonna be together uh, for 90 minutes. And today the topic, it's, uh, it's about a, a smart uh, villages, so very important topic for uh, the European Union. Uh, 90 minutes together. My name is Arno Morrison. I'm one of the thematic experts in uh, research and innovation at the Policy Learning Platform. And we are co-moderating this webinar with Mark here. How are you, Mark? Good, thank you, Arnaud. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. As Arnaud said, I'm the, the other half of the uh, policy learning platform uh, team on the research and innovation thematic. So thanks again for joining us. Excellent, Mark. And we had a lot of interest for this webinar because more than 200 participants uh, registered, which is, which is great. And we are very happy today because we have four excellent uh, speakers. Uh, we have with us uh, this afternoon, Maria Cresida Macondeu from DG Agri, and she's going to look uh, into uh, European initiatives for building smart villages. How are you this afternoon, Maria Cristina? Good afternoon. Great to have you here. Um, we also have with us uh, Enrique Nieto from ENRD, the European Network for Rural Development. And we are going to look at best practices uh, across the European Union. How are you this afternoon, Enrique? Thank you very much for the invitation. Happy to be here. Excellent, and great to have you here. Also with us uh, from France, uh, Clive Peckham from Nieve Numérique, and we're looking at the long smart village. How are you, Clive? Is Clive here? He's here. We, we just saw him, so he's here. And uh, we also have from Sweden, uh, Jan Malgren from uh, Vinderod in Sweden, the smart village. I'm sure I'm pronouncing that wrong, but um, how are you? You're pretty close. Thank you so much. Pretty close. <laughs> excellent. Excellent. Well, great to have you here as well. Thank you. All right. So uh, before we start with the speaker's presentation, uh, we are going to tell you a little bit more about Interreg Europe and the policy learning platform very quickly. Uh, so Interreg Europe is a very unique program uh, that aims to promote uh, interregional collaboration through better policies. Uh, it's very unique because it covers all uh, European countries, all European regions, and provides a combination of fundings with projects and uh, services. So, Interreg Europe, in a nutshell, it's really a capacity building program uh, working across uh, five policy objectives from cohesion policy, really to improve um, regional development policies. Uh, and it does that through uh, exchange of experience, innovative approach and capacity building, um, and is permanently de dedicated to policymakers and focusing on interregional uh, and exchanges and so on. So there are many actions, but the two main actions are really the projects where partners work on specific topics. So it can range from smart specialization strategy to digitization to uh, sustainable transportation and so on. And the second pillar of Intra Europe is the policy learning platform. And what we try to do at the policy learning platform is really to capitalize on all the wealth of knowledge uh, that has been created within uh, Inter Europe and try to diffuse this knowledge to as many policymakers uh, across the European Union. So what we do at the platform in a nutshell, we have uh, what we provide is, is really uh, continuous policy learning, capacity building opportunities. And we do, do that through access to uh, specific knowledge to connect, we also connect people and we provide dedicated expert support. So for instance, for access to knowledge, what we do, we write very nice policy briefs, articles, news and very different topics. Uh, for instance, I'm writing right now with Mark, a policy brief on innovation governance 
So really important and really interesting. We also connect people uh, and we provide policy inspiration uh, for practitioners uh, and policy makers. So we do that through uh, networking and uh, policy learning events such as webinar or workshop. We actually um, going to do a workshop on innovation ecosystems in October. So stay tuned on, on, on that. And lastly, what we do is experts, dedicated experts support. So we do that through policy app desk. So you can send us an email uh, and with your policy challenge as we will compile uh, good practices from Interreg Europe and give you like some specific uh, recommendations. We also do uh, matchmaking sessions. So it's only two hours. And it's great to, um, to learn from practitioners, from policymakers to network uh, on the latest insights regarding some specific policy uh, challenges that you might have in your regions. And lastly, we have the peer review. And Mark, maybe you're going to tell us a little bit more because you're traveling tomorrow to Gdansk for one yes. of the peer review. Indeed. Thanks, Arno. Uh, the, the peer reviews are what we like to call one of the flagship projects of the policy learning platform. Uh, it involves uh, the policy learning platform team, i.e. Arnaud, me, and our colleagues in Lille, finding some experts from across the, the policy learning uh, community uh, to come and work with you in, a, in your region uh, to work on a question, a policy challenge that you've identified. So as Arnaud said, uh, tomorrow I'm going with a team of four uh, European experts to Gdansk become particularly uh, famous at the moment. You see it on all the maps at the moment because it's next to some little enclave called Kaliningrad. So we'll have a nice view across the bay. Uh, and we are looking at the way in which uh, uh, regional ecosystems can support uh, their businesses, companies, their clusters, their stakeholders, their public authorities, access cooperative uh, research and innovation funding, such as Interreg, such as Horizon. So we've got experts from Portugal, uh, Holland, France, and Germany. So the policy learning platform team organizes these. There's an open call. Uh, there's no deadline. So if you want to send something tomorrow, the day after. And we've done 40 of them across Europe. Um, and I can see on, online today, we've got friends from Westland County, where Arno and I did our first online one back in 2019, 20, I can't 20, remember. 20, yes, COVID, 20, COVID time. COVID, um, and now we're doing them back uh, live with the real people. And um, one that's particularly interesting, I think, to the smart village uh, concept is one we did in Friesland in, in Northern uh, Holland, where there's a community uh, investment fund support all manner of uh, initiatives for rural community development, including, you know, uh, focusing on, on citizens in, in villages, uh, different stakeholder groups. And the idea is that after two days, uh, the experts and, and ourselves write you a recommendation report of, of what a, a new policy uh, you know, initiative could look like with concrete examples based on, you know, people who've got 20, 30 years experience who've come to share that with you. Um, so all the details you can find on the uh, Interreg Europe policy learning platform part of our, of our service platform. And um, if you've got any questions, you can use the chat or you can use the uh, follow-up emails to ask Arno or me about submitting uh, two pages is all that's required to, um, to access this service. So as you can see, we've covered many places in Europe. So it's a very popular service. So don't hesitate. And it's open to all thematics. So there's no um, barriers or, or bottlenecks of themes you can or can't deal with. So recommend uh, you have a look at this. Thank you, Mark. And indeed, Lotte, maybe you can put it, the links to <coughs> apply in the chat as well. Uh, so the topic of today, very important, uh, smart villages. Um, so this concept of, of smart villages um, you know, really emerge with uh, digital transformation. And it's really about to revitalize rural services through digital and social innovation. So using information communication technologies and this type of community led actions uh, and, and projects. So smart villages is not only about uh, having a fast Wi-Fi and a broadband, although it can help, uh, but um, it's also seizing multiple uh, opportunities and addressing policy challenges across uh, thematics and policy objectives. 
And of course, the policy learning platform can help. I mean, you saw all of our services. Mark talked about the, the, the peer review service that we have. We have also many, many good practices uh, that can inspire you to build like a smart village. Uh, regarding the smart thematic, we uh, done an online discussion on spaces for innovation, looking at all spaces, co-working spaces in uh, smart villages are really important to attract hybrid nom nomad workers, remote workers, and thanks to COVID, it has really been a, a huge uh, opportunities for, for smart villages and more rural villages. Uh, we also conducted a peer review uh, looking at digital digitalization strategy in a more rural county in Croatia. So you can have a look at uh, this peer review. Uh, we last, last month, we conducted a very nice webinar on local agri-food value chains, uh, looking at this example of, of a good practice, uh, the Mertolo uh, Food Network in Portugal, looking at, you know, smart villages can also build like this kind of local value chains um, to promote tourism, but also sustainable transformation. Uh, regarding the connected thematic, uh, there is a very nice policy brief re regarding sustainable transport modes uh, in rural areas. On the social uh, thematic, uh, you, Mark just mentioned the peer review to boost community resilience by small scale funding that he did uh, in, Fri in Friesland uh, County in uh, the Netherlands. We also wrote a very, very nice uh, story regarded, regarding integrated territorial investment and community-led local development. So you can have a look at it. And finally, for capacity building for local uh, and regional policymakers, you can always ask us for peer review or matchmaking or policy app desk. And that's it from us. Uh, now we can go into uh, presentations, and our first presentation is going to be from uh, Maya uh, Christina. So uh, the floor is yours. Uh, you have uh, 10 minutes, and then we have time for questions. For participants, the audience, please use the chat, ask questions. Uh, we want to make this uh, webinar as interactive as possible. So please, questions in the chat. I see already many people use the chat to tell us many things. Okay, to, okay, great. So Maria Cristina, the floor is yours and you have 10 minutes. So thank you very much. Uh, do you see my screen? Yes, it's perfect. It is perfect. Okay, so uh, good afternoon uh, uh, once again to everyone. First of all, uh, uh, thank you very much for inviting us to this webinar about smart villages. I am Maria Cristina Matrandreou and I work in DG Agri in the horizontal unit B3, which is responsible for social sustainability in agriculture and uh, rural areas. Uh, the unit is also responsible for local development of rural areas comprising leader, community-led local development and smart uh, villages. So today I'm going to present you the latest insights of smart villages to give you an overview about the concept and how uh, European funding instruments can support uh, smart village uh, strategies. Uh, I have prepared a couple of slides that give a detailed picture of the history of the background of the concept and what has been developed until now. Maybe I will skip uh, some of the, of, of the slides and I will focus uh, on the most important ones. Um, I suppose that uh, uh, everybody knows about the EU action plan for uh, smart villages uh, started in uh, 2017. Um, I, I, at that period, uh, the concept uh, it was relatively new. Uh, but the last years, uh, uh, we see a, a lot of smart villages uh, emerging, uh, not only around Europe, but uh, all over the world. But uh, the first time that officially uh, this uh, term uh, was formulated, it was the, uh, through this uh, European Action Plan for Smart Villages. Uh, my colleague uh, Enrique, uh, the next speaker, uh, will uh, present you more in details, uh, the, the work done uh, the last years from the European Network of, of, of Rural Development and the thematic group uh, about smart villages. And I, I would like uh, a little bit uh, to highlight uh, something about the definition of, of uh, smart villages. 
um, uh, a, a well-known uh, pilot project on smart eco-social villages, uh, tried for the first time uh, to give a definition uh, about what is uh, smart villas. Uh, uh, I will ask you, um, I will not read the, the definition, but I will ask you to keep some key words. Uh, rural com we talk about rural communities, about local contexts, smart solutions, participatory approach, strategies of course, cooperation, and variety of public uh, and private uh, sources. So I would like uh, just to present you uh, some uh, results uh, uh, of uh, two uh, pilot uh, uh, projects, uh, European Parliament uh, pilot projects uh, that we ran it uh, under the uh, responsibility of DG Agri. The first one, the first one is the so-called Smart Rural uh, 21. Uh, this, uh, uh, this project uh, has started in 2019 and it, uh, it continues until the end of the year. And with this project, we try, uh, if you want to translate the definition of uh, smart uh, villages into a real life context through supporting uh, 21 villages across Europe to develop, to prepare and implement a smart village uh, strategies. Uh, I, I will invite you really to, uh, uh, to, uh, to, um, to visit uh, the website uh, of this project. Uh, where you can find a lot of information. Uh, for example, a, a roadmap with uh, methodological steps for setting up a smart village strategy. You can find uh, smart solutions adopted by 21 pilot villages. Uh, and of course, a lot of information about uh, what is happening uh, in the member states. Um, this project, uh, it, uh, it is complemented uh, from a second one, uh, the so-called uh, Smart Rural uh, 27. Uh, it is, its objective is to prepare member states and rural communities uh, to be prepared uh, and implement smart villages uh, in the CAP, the Common Agricultural Policy uh, Strategic Plans, and the other policies and initiatives uh, which could potentially support the emergence of smart villages across uh, the, U the EU. So in the near future, um, it is planning to have a, a pilot smart village observatory uh, by encouraging the establishment of uh, smart village task forces in countries where there is an interest, uh, an interest uh, to participate. Um, an online geomapping tool uh, is preparing also to collect and share information about existing uh, smart villages uh, initiatives uh, and villages in transition. Um, and also in this, uh, in this website, you can find uh, a lot of uh, useful information uh, in all uh, European languages. So, of course, a smart village uh, is an attractive concept, but at the same time, it's, uh, it is challenging when it comes to the precise interpretation and the implementation uh, at the local level. So, there are some questions that uh, they came up uh, very frequently. And the first one, it is, what is a village? Um, the term of the village, uh, excuse me, the, the term of village must be convinced mostly as a rural community and not really uh, limited to just one village. And uh, of course, you will ask me how big or, or small a community under the smart village concept uh, can be. Uh, generally, there are no specific limitations or uh, restrictions. In a smart rural 20 project, uh, the selected 21 villages have a great diversity. Uh, the largest rural community in France is with some 10,000 inhabitants. And for example, in Italy, in, uh, the smallest one, it is with some uh, 50 permanent inhabitants. Uh, so the most important for smart villages is not the size, but uh, uh, succeeding, succeeding to engage a local community and to find uh, smart solutions uh, to its uh, problems. 
the second question is what is smart? Um, for smart villages, uh, smart is strong, strongly linked to innovative solutions, depending always on the specific context in which uh, it is implemented, of course. Um, you can imagine that uh, there are many discussions, uh, and there is a question if smart is equal to, di to digital. Uh, to this point, uh, we would all agree that digitalization is something that we can no longer ignore. And uh, uh, if we want to survive, we need to at least try to keep up with the pace of uh, digital innovation. But uh, smartness can be emerged also by new ideas, new services, new models, new practices to better address uh, social issues and meet the uh, social needs. So uh, social innovation uh, is also an important component in the smart village uh, concept. Uh, and let's not uh, forget that the idea of smart villas is a response to the current problems of rural communities, uh, such as the depopulation, uh, the, the youth migration, the, the lack of services. So another uh, important question is uh, um, what is um, the funding? What are the funding opportunities to support the preparation and the implementation of, uh, of uh, smart villages? Um, in the new programming period, uh, there is a range of European policies which are relevant uh, to support smart villages, but uh, the common agricultural policy remains the key policy to support directly the preparation and implementation of uh, smart villages. Uh, in, the, in the new regulation, there are some recitals that make reference, uh, direct reference uh, to smart villages uh, and the need to foster knowledge, innovation, and uh, digitalization in rural areas. Uh, there are uh, two types of interventions uh, under Article 73 and uh, 77, um, which propose support to smart villages. And of course, there is a result indicator about the number of uh, supported smart, uh, small, uh, smart village uh, strategies. So uh, practically speaking, uh, there are three ways uh, to, to, to support uh, smart villages through the strategic, uh, the CAP strategic plans. Uh, first of all, uh, under cooperation intervention, uh, when uh, uh, you can obtain a support for preparation and implementation of, uh, of the strategies. A second one, it is through the leader local uh, development strategies. And a third one, uh, it is uh, through the, uh, the intervention regarding uh, investments uh, in, in infrastructure, in basic services, etc. Uh, just to give you an idea, in the submitted uh, CAP strategic plans, the majority of member states yes, has proposed to include uh, smart villages in the uh, leader local development strategies in order to support the, prepare, the preparation and the implementation. Uh, of course, uh, cohesion policy is also expected to contribute to the development uh, of smart uh, village strategies through mainly the territorial, uh, uh, the territorial uh, instruments. Um, of course, uh, inter also, with regional policy uh, and the work you have already done with preparation, it, it is a possible uh, funding uh, for uh, supporting the smart, uh, 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 smart villages. Um, there are also other uh, European uh, strategies uh, that they can support uh, depending the type of ac actions uh, in, in the smart village strategies, of course. And uh, at the end, I can also propose Horizon Europe or, or, uh, with research projects. But in this case, if you want, the civil society, uh, the municipalities, they are not direct uh, uh, partners, but they can benefit uh, indirectly uh, from uh, the research uh, projects. So uh, I skip this, uh, uh, okay. So the last one, I, I would like also to, um, to say that um, smart village activities also uh, feed into the activities under the long-term vision of rural areas. 
there are already some flagships uh, and uh, proposed action related to smart villages as uh, the setup of a, a rural revitalization platform, uh, the networking of leader uh, local development strategies and the local action groups and smart villages, um, and a startup village forum. So um, to conclude, I would like um, uh, just to, 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 to present you some uh, some uh, some lessons learned from Smart uh, Rural 21 and uh, 22 project. Um, smart villages are already there, uh, and they, they try to find solutions uh, to local problems and, and to a wide range of, of fields from agriculture uh, to community facilities to bioeconomy to energy topics. Uh, of course, we need the flexibility uh, for using this concept and, and try to find, to find the funding in different national, regional, and local contexts. Uh, of course, uh, we should be always aware and we, we should uh, uh, make sure uh, that EU support can uh, reach uh, beneficiaries on the ground. Uh, the most important, uh, as I have already said, is the local engagement. Uh, many rural communities uh, have lost uh, uh, and continue to lose people. So we need um, creative approaches uh, to engage certain groups uh, and many young people. And the last but not least, um, the experience until now showed that we need uh, uh, there's a lot of need of capacity building and animating uh, this uh, process to set up a smart village uh, strategy. And so just to conclude, maybe many of you know that uh, two weeks uh, ago, there was uh, the Rural Pact uh, Conference uh, for uh, the long-term vision for rural areas. Uh, and I would like just to, to share with you uh, a, a message uh, coming uh, from uh, the participants that smart villages uh, is the right tool uh, because it brings together uh, together people. So thank you very much. And if you need uh, more information, uh, I have put here uh, the links for the of the smart uh, rural 21 and 27 uh, projects. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you very much, uh, Maria and Christina. That was a very comprehensive uh, presentation. And I'm sure Mark has some questions. Uh... Yeah, thanks, Maria and Christina. There are some points in the discussion that you can probably answer afterwards, some technical ones that Arnaud and I wouldn't risk at answering. Um, two questions were, first, uh, you mentioned the sort of urban-rural uh, dimension, and I am wondering whether the the COVID, uh, the sort of the green societal challenge messages that are now very uh, you know prevalent in in rural and urban communities, did any of those messages change the direction of your uh, uh, call? You said there have been two phases. I'm wondering whether there's been any adjustment to the priorities in the calls uh, when you relaunched the. Uh, Phase two, and any, any reactions to those big changes with COVID and, and sort of the Green Deal? Uh, look, until now, because uh, um, uh, Smart Run 21 and 27 projects, uh, they are going. Mm. So we are waiting uh, also uh, some, uh, to see some results of how COVID uh, has changed some attitudes mm. uh, regarding uh, rural uh, urban uh, linkages. Mm. Uh, but, uh, you know, my personal view is that as we talk about local communities um, working for smart villages, um, the main uh, directions will stay the same. Mm. But let's uh, wait for, for the results of, of the report. Well, one of the issues that we've seen in, in rural, particularly coastal areas, is house prices have uh, been affected by the, the sort of the home working urbanites and how their local councils are now restricting house purchase or restricting the period of, of rental uh, to make housing more affordable and accessible to local rural communities. So 
uh, they're, they're trying to find responses in this case to, to housing so it's uh, and you know something mm -hmm. but housing even before covid uh, crisis mm -hmm. uh, it was a problem for Pro rural areas huh? mm -hmm. uh, so it hasn't gone away it's got worse yeah but it's still yes. So maybe we should have a, a more uh, particular look uh, uh, at this issue. Yeah, and one last comment on your you know, your summary um, bullet points of lessons, uh, particularly like the, the message about animation. Um, and Arnaud said we did some, a peer review with Friesland, uh, so North Holland, and the expert from Slovenia uh, highlighted the role of ambassadors in rural communities to take forward the policies and to act as a, sort of a magnet for exchange alongside the elected people. So uh, finding these sort of ambassadors who can act as a sort of a focal mm. point for community development and animation, I think was quite, quite interesting when you, you said that. Yes, it is very interesting, and you know something. Um, uh, um, according to the um, twenty-one, let's say, pilot smart villages, um, um, we we noticed that there are a lot of models. So, if you want, in some villages, the leader is the mayor. Mm. Uh, in other examples, uh, it might be um, an association, a non-governmental organization. In some other cases, uh, there are, it is the leader local action groups. Uh, Mm. So it's time, if you want, you need a, um, a, a support group uh, to start to initiate uh, this, uh, this process. Yeah. But at mm -hmm. the same time, you need the, the, the engagement and the involvement of the local communities, because otherwise you, you mm. will not find the small solutions. Mm. Yes, mm -hmm. not in isolation, but it can be a different person that fits the village circumstances. Yes, mm -hmm. of course, you need also, maybe for some specific projects, mm -hmm. you need also uh, an external ex expertise. Yeah, and give these people training and capacity building skills. Yeah, yeah I think we'll hear I, about that in the good practices later. Mark, Maria Cristina, please stay with us. We're moving to uh, next presenter, Enrique Nieto from European Network for Rural Development. The floor is yours and you have uh, 10 minutes as well. Thank you very much, Arno. I will try to build uh, from the comprehensive and very good presentation that uh, Maria just made uh, about smart villages. Uh, I will skip probably some of the slides which are about the concept, but probably I will reinforce some of the elements which we found in, in our work in the European Network for Rural Development on, on smart villages. Um, I think uh, it, it is clear the, the overall picture, and we all understand that rural areas are in a, in a transformation pathway. There are many opportunities that can be addressed in rural areas related to energy, low carbon homes, sustainable forestry, agriculture, uh, uh, biogas, bicycles, etc. Uh, regarding the social element, the economic and ecology, and culture as well. So. Uh, rural areas are areas that are uh, affected and that could become excellent partners for the development and addressing many of the challenges that Europe are, is facing at the moment. So I think that that's the overall context. Of course, many of them faces many challenges, but I think they all have the potential. I think that the spirit of the smart villages, they all have the potential to become uh, lively areas uh, and contribute to the future of Europe. And that's why I think the definition came in a way that some of you might find a bit uh, too open, but some others found it uh, much more inclusive. Uh, so by, by having some of the concepts open for, for everyone to, uh, um, by having some of the concepts open, many villages can feel themselves with the potential to at some point become a smart village. So not having very restrictive criteria so that many would feel as well excluded. So whether for some people that could be a, a drawback, I think uh, from the people that we were engaged in, in drawing this definition, we find this an opportunity to really uh, be able to include all rural areas in, in, in this path. I think many of the things uh, about the concept Ma Maria already highlighted, and I think it, it's important to mention that this is about a transition. Smart villages is not a one-off thing that you do is rather a process where you want to engage. So you have a point of departure where you can have many problems and many opportunities, 
and you have to visualize the point of arrival that you want for your village around many of the issues that we were discussing, digital transformation, low carbon and circular economy, social innovation, services innovation, new value chains, rural urban cooperation. Those are the ambitions. And I think through smart villages, it allows you to get there. But of course, as being a process, you need to plan it accordingly. So there is no one specific roadmap on how you can become at the end of smart villages. I think what is important is that you plan that process and the activities that you might need to conduct to get to your final uh, destination uh, might vary from village to village. And that's what people need to co-create. So one key element here is precisely the animation and facilitation, what you were mentioning at the end of, of the discussion with, with Maria. The role of having some local partners that are able to drive these the communities towards achieving, designing and implementing all the all the steps that they, they, they need to take. This might entail, you know, working around, identifying the needs of your area, designing your strategies, doing some feasibility studies of the innovation you want to apply, involve research institutes to, to try to define the, the innovative solution, implement certain pilots, start invest, investing in a small scale on, on these solutions, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, the, the pathway is endless. But I think, again, what it's important is to think strategically and have an idea of where you start, where you want to be, and plan those actions. So what I would like to present today uh, as well are a number of examples of smart villages. And normally in meetings when I present smart villages and I start with these examples, people are a bit shocked because they think smart villages are just about digital technologies. Um, and in fact, it is a core component on many of the innovative solutions we need to apply for some of the problems and opportunities we face, but they are not the only ones. Um, and I like to start with this example about energy. As you know, in Europe, uh, there is now a, a stable framework to support renewable energy communities in, in, across Europe. And in fact, rural areas are uh, very suitable for, for those approaches. And here I just present one example uh, from Germany where uh, there was an area with a lot of farmers with a lot of uh, residues uh, from agricultural practices which uh, they decided to come together, partner with the, with the villages, create a village cooperative and invest uh, to, to generate gas. And through that process, heat up the houses of the villages. So, so now that cooperative, it's profitable, is selling energy to the grid, is getting profits back to the community um, and so on. And this uh, approach is started by mobilizing the community, bringing them together, understanding what to do, pilot, trying to identify what it was needed. Uh, and then of course, when you have a, a, a marketable product or project, then you can get loans from, from the bank. So it started as a leader project with 200,000, actually to mobilize the community and start with the piloting. And based on these results, they were able to access uh, higher funds uh, for the cooperative. So they got, the project over the price two and a half million. So everything started with seed money from the 200,000. Uh, the other project now, this is on digitalization and it comes from Germany as well. And I think what this project brings is, it's in a sense, the model, uh, smart villages and, and, and an interesting point that smart villages might not be purely bottom up, you might not find everything you need to become smart within your area. So that goes sometimes beyond this endogenous development approach. And in fact, in many cases, it's actually a combination of uh, the bottom-up approach with the top-down approach. Maria mentioned before that in some cases, you might need some knowledge and some innovation sources. And those actors might not be in your village those actors might be outside your village, namely the university, a hub, a private company, uh, and so on. So it's the combination of the two that make as well, in many cases, uh, local communities to find innovative approaches to their problems. And in this sense, this digital villages approach was actually run by the Fraunhofer Institute, which is a national level research institute, who moved down on the ground to work directly with a number of uh, communities. They sat together, they developed an ecosystem, they identified the problem, 
and together they co-developed and co-designed the digital solutions they wanted to develop. So in a sense, with these national actors and local actors, what they developed was a local rural innovation ecosystem through which many solutions came in many different areas in the health sector, in trade, communication, logistics, energy, industry, farming, okay? Uh, again, I think it simplifies very well this point of, of the top uh, combination of top down and, and bottom up. Um, another one, and I think what, what the example I'm gonna provide now, is sometimes, uh, you know, rural areas do not have the basics to do digitalization, which means the broadband. And that doesn't mean they cannot do anything. There are, again, communities that come together and with the support of external experts, they were able to bring first connectivity and broadband. And in this case was the creation of an open broadband network at, at the village level using actually the street uh, lighting. So they created a, a network of, of Wi-Fi open for everybody to use, publicly owned. Um, and on the basis of that platform, and it didn't stay like that, and I think that's the, the value of this approach was that it didn't focus only on connectivity, but as well on the, what are you gonna use this connectivity for, right? And together with that, developed as well the skills and the capacities of the local population to maximize the use of that, 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 that infrastructure, which is quite expensive in many cases. So I just took an example of, of something they did about rural uh, smart tourism. In this, in this village. So basically there is a public uh, intervention in the same, which is about bringing the, the, the basic infrastructure, free Wi-Fi, installing a, a smart platform with sensors and so on. And around that, they created other private sector initiatives. They call it uh, lighthouse projects that maximizes that infrastructure that was made there. So they maximize the use of the data that they can collect through the different sensors they install. Uh, and that's uh, some companies as well install those sensors. Uh, they use it as well to manage tourism services, to offer e-culture services. They now use it as well for care. So they are linking as well tourism with the, with the kind of silver economy. So a lot of elders want to go there because it, it is set for them. And, 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 and other around mobility, for instance, you know, there are rental bicycles because they know where the tourists are going to go and, and, and so on and so forth. So I think here is, again, a good combination of not thinking in an integrated approach, uh, thinking about, OK, bring the broadband, but I also think of what are the things I can do around that from the private perspective and from the public perspective. So they work together in, in, in a partnership. Another important uh, uh, element, uh, mobility in rural areas, is it's, it's a big issue. And we've seen in the past with the Gillesian issue in France, it came actually out of a, a mobility policy uh, and prices for, for gas and a revolution emerging from some rural areas saying like, look, our income is enough uh, and, and we are very dependent on cars. But again, we cannot forget that there are as well many people that do not have access to the car, so they cannot drive anymore. And particularly in the context with, a, with an aging population that we have as well in rural areas, this, this, this has been difficult. And in fact, in France, they have moved to a model. Um, and, and I think what it exemplifies is that technologies that are, might be available might not be tuned for rural areas. And in fact, what they did, these guys, is to take the blah, blah car concept and technology, but it was not working at, at their local level, at the rural area level. So what they, they decided was to adapt it to their circumstances. So again, they needed external intervention of those that had the IT possibilities to develop this app and working it at the local level. They, dis they designed this, this uh, platform, which is about base based and on- I can, And I can, one more minute. Yes, thank you. It's about hitchhiking points. So again, they work, it's a combination of private sector, public sector working together with local civil society to come up with solutions. Uh, that might not be in the market. And I think I will conclude with this slide. And these are the outcomes of uh, last work that we did in the NRD about what are the enabling factors to revitalize rural areas. And in fact, we have identified five key pieces of the puzzle to revitalize rural areas. And you will see that some of them are very linked to the concept as well of smart villages. We talk about an integrated approach. We talk about multi-level governance, engaging different levels, different actors. 
we're talking about boosting the local capacities. We need people to engage. We need people with the capacity to maximize the use of that. Territorial cooperation, it is key. As you see in the examples, it's all about cooperation at different levels and boosting innovation and finding the right models on how at local level you can push local innovation in rural areas, right? I just put the final slide where you can find more information of what, did, what we did. And there is a, per, a dedicated portal for that with a lot of briefings on, on the different, with the different examples we, we talked about. And also there is a community on Facebook with more than 2000 members that is very active on the road, sharing a lot of insights on, on smart people. Thank you very much. All right, excellent. Thank you very much, Enrique, for sharing all those uh, good practices. I see there are many questions uh, in the chat. I think the question of Alan would be great to ask for all the participants in the panel. So let's wait uh, for it. Uh, and I see one participant at the end race, but she, she left. But Mark. Well, I, I, firstly, uh, thanks to Enrique. And you, you highlighted why uh, uh, the PLP and uh, ENRD have organized uh, joint events. I think this is our third one. We, we came to your annual meeting, then you came to one of ours and now here. So it's uh, very, very good to, to share this. I was indeed going to pull out one of uh, Alan Whiteside's uh, from Scotland's questions because on your penultimate slide, Enrique, you have the sort of the wheel of fortune and there's many, many different choices. And one I was gonna pick in relation to Alan's question might be a different one you're asking, Arnaud, but the social challenges, we've got fuel poverty, and we've got food poverty, which are you know issues that are becoming more and more prevalent in this new era of inflation that many people can't uh, think. So I was wondering whether these social challenges on, on, on fuel or food uh, are, are emerging uh, or issues that uh, uh, you have some policy uh, recommendations to, uh, to, to, to offer us. Yes, um, I, I think uh, I started with a message saying that I think rural areas are key partners for addressing many of the challenges in Europe. And we see, for instance, nowadays issues around energy prices and so on. Uh, and actually I started my presentation saying rural areas can actually become um, uh, energy, mm -hmm. energy providers, uh, while at the same time rural areas benefit from, uh, in a way, the exhaustion. So there are models for a win-win situation rather than a traditional approach of big corporation coming to rural areas, extract benefits from there, and, and the remaining in the benefits in the rural areas are, are really small, and actually that was counterproductive. And in that sense, I think there are, uh, the smart villages, what it allows is to explore um, within all these thematic areas, innovative ways on how rural areas could become a a strong partner um, for addressing the European uh, challenges nowadays. There is no one prescription uh, on how to do the things. I think the, the key and the value of this approach is that it's left to local communities to work together on the solution that fits them the best. Uh, for As I said, for some that might be a challenge or a problem, I think it is actually the value of, of this approach uh, that it, it leaves the local communities to act. Uh, and the, what is important is that at policy level, the tools are provided for these communities to really uh, uh, be, to accompany this community in this process without hampering them with a lot of difficulties in terms of administrative burdens and, and, and deadlines and, and things like that. I think that that's the biggest challenge. And when you mentioned about the pieces of the puzzle, I don't think it's about picking one. I think it's about making sure that all these pieces are interconnected at the same time. Uh, so when we think about the strategy, it's not just the strategies that you put in place as well, the tools to support on the ground, local capacity, local innovation and territorial cooperation, therefore enabling these communities to act. Yeah, I think you're right. It's a holistic uh, approach you need. To, and at the rural level, you can probably deal with it rather than at a metropolitan. I, I think of, again, the connection to some other funding programs, uh, the LIFE uh, program at the moment offers some interesting uh, investment, uh, you know, uh, accelerator of projects that you could uh, you mentioned. Uh, equally, in the uh, the ex Cosme program, you know, single market program, they uh, one of the questions we saw raised is, are there any thematic approaches? And we've seen uh, how digital and tourism 
digital and wine, digital and. So connecting those uh, you know, sectors with a, a you know, digital is one ex example of accelerator. Could also be another way to put in place what you've said, the sort of holistic and, and make sure you answer all, all those questions. Um, Arnaud, were you looking at uh, the question on remote access to education, university education the questions? Yeah, I think it would be great to ask for everyone at the end in the yeah. panel discussion. Yeah, so, so start yeah. thinking about that one, everybody. Yes, 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 yes. What your ideas. So, Enrique, you stay with us, think about the questions, and let's move to Lorm Smart Village. Thank and, you, Enrique. And thank you so much. Yes, Clive. Maybe short presentation of your video because it's going to be a virtual tour, uh, one minute, and then Lotte will show us uh, the video, five minutes video. Okay, thanks very much, and thanks very much to Arno. Thanks very much, Mark, for the invitation today. And um, sorry, I'm, there's hay making outside, and they're making a hell of a lot of noise. Just a minute. I'm rural life for you Clive it's rural it, life exactly exactly <laughs> it really was just in the bottom okay just very very quickly on the introduction what I really wanted to show you today was a real example of a of a, of a smart village or as they call themselves the village of the future and I think the example of Lorm we've done a lot of work with the NRD actually so highlighting the work that Lorm has done as really being a light ship for villages of the future smart villages in France and this, the video we produced today, which I think really helps to encapsulate what this vision, as they call it themselves now, it's a, it's a, a village as a hub. And rather than having hubs, it's actually looking at the way you can have all these different activities really within a community, digital, economic, makers, fab labs, involving the communities in really redesigning their village that we want to show you an example from Lorm. And this was produced as a video for um, a workshop, in fact, a participatory laboratory during the European Week of Regions and Cities, where together with three other countries, we really want to show the, the way that hubs, and in this case, the village as a hub, can really be motors of development. So I'll just go over straight to the, village, uh, straight to the, to the video and let it really speak for itself and then leave some time at the, the end for answers. So here we are, over to this video, with some of the key stakeholders from the village of Lorme. Thank you. Thank you, Clive. The one thing is key here in Lorme is the fact that it's not just digital innovation. It's not just digital services. It's about involving the citizens in redesigning their village, a village of the future. We've seen, we can see murals there that people have painted. There are recycling shops. We, we went and we visited a, a new sort of restaurant, a, a place for, for food, for enjoyment, for music. And it's all part of this effort to create these different hubs, music hubs, cultural hubs, digital hubs, which work together. And that is what is fundamental about this small town. It's the way that these different hubs work together to create a real village of the future. And that is what we're trying to do within our project, within Carpedesium, show how it's necessary not only to work on the digital, but to work on a real social and economic inclusion of all rural stakeholders within the design of their villages, their rural areas of the future. La Mission Numérique est une association qui accompagne les habitants dans leurs apprentissages, leurs projets ou encore leurs démarches. Une structure qui permet d'accompagner les gens du territoire, les habitants du territoire, à l'usage des nouvelles technologies. Je rappelle qu'à l'époque, il n'y avait pas encore la DSL qui était ici. Donc c'était important qu'on montre aux gens à la fois à servir d'un ordinateur, mais qu'on leur montre également à aller sur Internet et à voir un peu ce qui est arrivé maintenant. Le numérique évolue lui aussi. La mission numérique va alors s'adapter à ces changements pour proposer l'accompagnement le plus adapté à ses utilisateurs. Autrefois, dans ce bâtiment, on apprenait à servir d'un ordinateur et maintenant, les demandes du public sont bien évoluées. Les gens disent bah, « moi j'aimerais faire de la, du montage vidéo maintenant ». C'était quelque chose qui n'était pas imaginable il y a encore 15 ans ici. Espace de télétravail, de réunion, atelier numérique, studio, à chaque besoin, sa réponse numérique. On ne vient pas faire du numérique ou de l'informatique pour faire de l'informatique ou du numérique. On y vient parce qu'on a envie de faire de la généalogie, parce qu'on a envie de s'enregistrer. Et à ce moment-là, on touche du doigt l'inclusion numérique. Le centre de ressources numériques au milieu de la forêt Morvandel, 
la mission numérique s'est finalement imposée comme véritable institution pour les habitants. Une maison du numérique, où habitués comme itinérants, trouvent leur place. Ma famille numérique du Morvan et à la mission numérique du pays niverné Morvan. Un bijou pour l'Orne. À tous les deux, hein, ils sont précieux pour moi. À travers le village tiers-lieu de l'Orne, une aventure se dessine. Le projet Village du Futur. Les initiatives locales s'inscrivent dans un dessin plus global pour concevoir l'identité de la commune. Nos, nos villages vont être à la fois très autonome et très connecté au monde. Au fond, ils sont déjà très connectés au monde. Ici, alors, il y a de la fibre optique. Voilà, on, peut, on a du très haut débit. Voilà, il y a numérique à travailler pour ça. Mais ce n'est pas forcément suffisant. Il faut aussi de l'autonomie locale. Au-delà de la vision globale à long terme, la population est mise au cœur de ce projet. Le village est ainsi vu comme véritable lieu d'échange où les habitants sont les parties prenantes de l'avenir de la commune. Ce qui est également la, la marque de Fabrique de Village du Futur, c'est vraiment le travail avec la population. Les habitants, le conseil municipal ont travaillé avec une équipe d'architectes pour imaginer les transformations à faire sur les dix ans qui suivent. Avec ce véritable tiers-lieu grandeur nature, le village s'ouvre au monde entier et à toutes ses possibilités. C'est la, la cité tout entière qui est un lieu euh, ouvert au projet. Voilà, je crois que ce qui fait la, en fait, la différence et ce qui donne envie de venir ici s'installer à l'Orme, comme l'ont fait euh, par exemple l'établissement qui nous accueille aujourd'hui, c'est euh, un esprit très ouvert. Voilà, Quelqu'un vient avec un projet, on l'accueille, ça ne veut pas dire que tout va se faire ou tout va se faire tout de suite, mais open the door. Dans ce petit village niverné, les projets innovants ne cessent de voir le jour. Grâce au réseau national Make Ici, demain, la manufacture collaborative rurale Ici Morvan créera une véritable communauté pour aider à relancer le Made in Morvan par le fer. Dans cette manufacture, nous allons accueillir des ateliers partagés en céramique, bois, métal, un Fab Lab avec des machines numériques. On va faire une spécificité son vidéo parce qu'il est, qu est lié au fait qu'à l'Orme, depuis 25 ans, il y a un festival à la chanson française, qu'on a des artistes musiciens, qu'on a des photographes, qu'on a des vidéastes, qu'on a même des décorateurs de publicité et de, de, de cinéma. Grâce à la richesse du lieu Lormois et de sa communauté, Ici Morvan proposera un cadre exceptionnel en plein cœur du parc naturel du Morvan. Donc l'idée, c'est aussi de travailler avec ce qui, se, ce qui est à l'Orme et aux alentours pour pouvoir euh, créer des choses. Ça veut dire qu'on est en Bourgogne, on a la possibilité de bien manger, on a la possibilité de faire des activités de la nature, on a la possibilité d'aller visiter des musées, de découvrir la Nièvre, de découvrir le Morvan, en plus de venir faire du prototypage. Tout le village est concerné par ce projet. Un modèle rural est en train de se créer. All right, very, very nice um, video, uh, Clive. Um, looks great. Um, yeah, I wish I, I was in, in Lom right now. It looks uh, fab labs and everything. So, so cool. Um, a question for you. How does everything have changed with um, the COVID-19 crisis? I mean, how did you feel that in, in Lom? Well, the I think one thing to point out first is that this project goes back 20 years. Not long started its um, work on digital transformation 20 years ago. And through this evolution of this capacity building within the community, when COVID struck, they were far more able to do, deal with it than many other communities. They had the internal capacity. I mean, you're looking at things like the Fab Lab, which now there's going to be a makerspace there, they were able to create visors there, they were able to use the capacity of the village to answer the, the real questions that are posed by COVID. They started to work on developing a, what they call a rural drive-in for the you know, local producers to be able to sell their, to sell their food to local inhabitants. Mm. They were able to mobilize the community really to answer. So I think that's, it showed that You had the capacity, it didn't mean there were difficulties, but it really showed how valuable this approach is to actually making rural communities far more resilient and able really to answer crises such as COVID. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Clav. Mark, do you mm. have any, any questions? Yeah, I mean, I think I read somewhere or I heard it on the video, uh, Clive, that Lorme has a population of 1,200, 1,500 yeah. people. 
I mean, you, you, you talked about um, some using public art and, and other things. Are there other awareness raising issues that, you know, for those who aren't directly involved in, in the project that you use to reach out to the sort of rural community who, who uh, maybe are more reliant on old fashioned, you know, municipal bulletins, uh, local press paper? Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I, I think, Look, look at this from two ways from this let's look at it within the wider community but also within the local community i mean that one of the first things that happened as part of the village of the future project which is the people saying we uh, the main thing for us is the town's dull boring it's gray it's brown and they painted the shutters and they created murals and that came from the people and when there was an old garage in the middle of the town which was, you know, was abandoned so now it's been converted into an open space and um, to gardens so it's really getting people involved in actually looking at what they want to see redesigning but at the same time actually it is it has a fiber connection you can go there and you've got a better connection than probably in most large cities so it's the two things and exactly as the mayor said it's being it's being hyper connected but it's also working on the local. So it's really ensuring that there's the openness to the outside world. And then there's also the openness within the community. And recently the mayor and um, other elected representatives have started up something called the laboratory for the village of the future, working with other mayors and rural councils within France and within the region, really to share ideas to organize regular meetings. So I think that's another example of it's sharing, it's really showing what can be done and working with others to help them um, undertake similar processes adapted to their own needs in their own communities. Mm. Okay. All right. Thank you. thank you, Clive. Uh, thank you for sharing this uh, inspiring good practices from Cape Digem. So great to have you here. Last but not least, we're moving to, uh, to Sweden for last uh, presentation. Jan, you have uh, eight, eight minutes as well for your presentation and the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Smart to be our smart villages. We are a research village for what's sustainable. And we've done a lot. Uh, we are 5,000 citizens and we're now increasing with 1,200 new households. And the question is how to do this in sustainable. And Webrud is quite cozy, small, a lot of nature. And to this, we started in 2008 a website with, with youngsters. And we have about 200 uh, companies locally that's supporting this. And this is the communication platform for us. So this is really important. And also together with youngsters, of course, they write articles and this is the base of communication. So uh, we have a lot of user cases that I will present. First of all, cows. We have a problem with that, uh, with water bins. So we started to measure in 2018 water bins, the levels of them. And we put up a LoRa system that measured this in the fields. And we got alarms like this, so we can actually save uh, calcium dehydration. And it looks like this in technical terms. And we also got a, out information of how often they were there for drinking and also for the alarms so we can send out the farmer to repair. Furthermore, we, we went to smart trees so we connected trees in the village to uh, tell us when they needed water. So we uh, were saving water for this. And we also got a lot of interesting data out of it, how water goes through soil. We use drones to send the medicine to the village to uh, explore how the citizens like the useful drones. And we got a good reception of this. So the maturity of, of the village is really good. We also made... Uh, tracking system for bicycles. This is actually my bike who got stolen and I could follow it together with the local police. And I just told the taxi to drop me out the place he was stolen, telling me where it was ending. So this is actually a real photo of my picture uh, on my uh, bike. But we don't only use technology, we use a lot of uh, democracy uh, as well and, and dialogue. And we asked the village what kind of companies do you want? And a pharmacy was on the top of the list. So we went out and got signature, digital signatures. And in two days, we got 500 signatures. On the third day, we got a pharmacy calling. In 14 days, we got 1,700 signatures. 
And after six months, we got, got a pharmacy. Uh, and this is how we want to do it, bottom up. Furthermore, we have youngsters who uh, explore the contamination of the creek. This is the blue line is the creek going through the village. And together with the uh, real labs, we found out that we are a uh, nice minus village. We have magnesium and zinc and so on from the cars going out. And we can use that to uh, develop the village to take away that. And so maybe we can even leave water more clear than we took it. This is live stone in the middle. This is actually a LoRa sensor that live measure the water quality. And we put it at our digital twin of the village. We have water valves and a lot of others that are uh, also LoRa that is wireless and we can put them almost everywhere where we have water. We have a big water company who wants to make our village as the most sustainable when it comes to drinking water, and they use AI to use uh, to determine where there are leaks in the ground. And we furthermore use this as a heat map. So this is a result of that. The more red, the more water we use. So we can use that for information on water consumption, basically. Very easy to, to do. We have virtual doctors. This is how we use HoloLens and, and show that even rural areas can have real experts in 3D live in, in uh, our place. Smart lampposts, of course, uh, they light up when the car comes, but also light up when there are pedestrians crossing. So they save energy and, and increase uh, safety. We have made a big uh, 3D model of our village with a drone, 50,000 pictures of it. And it, the first 3D model of our village two years ago looks like this. And we are presenting faults in this uh, example here. This is uh, the complete 3D model. And we also add sensors into it. So we actually got a digital twin of the complete village. The 3D model is five square kilometer big. And if we zoom in, we can go into different kinds of sensors like a gate open in preschool, and we can get autom automatic alarms for this. And the purpose of this is to populate a lot of sensors and use AI later on to see connections, how the organism of a village really works. Mobility is one of the most uh, projects we have, like 15 minute cities like you have in France. So we have several of those projects. One is called Flow, where we measure traffic. And it looks uh, like we, we asked the village, where are the most traffic? And we got this response in two days. So we deployed a radar. And this is an anonymous radar where we can live see for a year how the cars go and speed and so on. And we get statistics out how fast, the how many, and everything with that. Furthermore, we got a project uh, with Boston University where we look into the number of cars. Here you see the number of cars per day. And we have those kind of, how, how can we cope with 50% or more traffic, more bikes, uh, parking places, and so on. And we started this uh, project with Red Hat and Boston University. So they got a two year project where they simulate the traffic in our village to see how the future of mobility in a village can work. So we are also implementing this in 3D as well. And so if the bus is going through the village, you will see it in the 3D uh, twin, digital twin as well. This is uh, one of the crossings that we live are recording uh, for getting input for the Boston. So they get real input. So the simulations are as correct as possible. Uh, problems like new areas, how the traffic will be. And we are trying to play around and see different kinds of solutions in the 3D world for mobility. This is also, we include youngsters. This is uh, wetlands and they actually include kids, children in the village to make uh, playgrounds for connected to water. So this is actually the village creating 
uh, the environment for ourselves together with children. There are some of the examples what they want from preschool here. Social sustainability is very high for us. Mobility is mostly measured in time and money, but also social. If you have 40 people in a big bus, you're anonymous. But if you have an autonomous bus for four people, you get more social, you speak to people. So that is also something we want to be including. And if we look at this, maybe we can measure health or even happiness like this, where we get two heat maps of happiness or loneliness and water consumptions. And then we can ask question, are we more healthy or more lonely if we use more water and, and questions like that. So that is why we open up Weber for a research village for universities and companies. And we think this is change of society because digitalization reduces distance for rural areas. Villages no longer need to grow into cities to provide service. And this is very important for us. Cities can be said to consist of villages. That means that we have a lot of village feeling. Maybe we can export the village feeling into cities. And that is, we have got a lot of response for how to develop this to have, let we say, smart cities and smart villages become smart regions. Thank you. Eight minutes. Excellent. Great job. Many slides, eight minutes or more or less. Thank you very much, Jan. That was uh, super interesting. I've got a question. I mean, I didn't count the number of initiatives you, you showed us, but uh, I was wo just wondering what initiative is the most appreciated by the local uh, inhabitants? <laughs> uh, local inhabitants is, uh, well, first of all, the first uh, PR we got was the cow, basically. The cow from the first uh, water bin was on the papers and political and, and went viral. Um, <coughs> We, we have a started for a fab lab as well. So that is quite um, interesting for the citizens. They learn to 3D CAD and 3D print as well, locally mm -hmm. in, in clay, in plastic as well. And we also became a fab city, the first Nordic fab city. Mm -hmm. We're working with the operating system, how to share this and teleport stuff instead of shipping them. So I think that is the most uh, interesting mm -hmm. for youngsters. We have courses for youngsters and adults. Mm -mm. All right, excellent. Mark, do you have any question before we move on yeah, to the panel? Yeah, I think uh, you mentioned an um, interesting point on this urban rural dimension and some of us will remember there's an interreg Europe project called Rumor that uh, dealt with this issue and I, I liked your sentence about bringing you know city services into villages through through digital. Uh, but my question to, to, to Yuan is, um, we saw lots of young people, uh, and you know, we and you know, it's a, it's a young village. Uh, are there any specific, uh, uh, you know, mechanisms or initiatives that you've used to sort of mm. get them on board? I mean, we saw with Clive's video, we, we saw a, a lady at 80 years uh, having a great time in the recording studio, mm. uh, and then we saw your first image was like 10 young people, Yan. So, what, what's the trick for getting the young people? Uh, engaged to this type of initiative. I would say empowerment uh, for them. And uh, I, I, I see a change in youngsters. They want to live in rural areas as long as they can earn money, and have good mm -hmm. education, all that. So I, I think the digitization will sh shows this. The corona has also shown that it's possible to work from home. Mm -hmm. So I, th I, I think that's an opening for young people as well. And we have a lot of interest from very young, but also like uh, older people, of course, you know, seniors and stuff like that. So we, we love to open up for youngsters. Mm. And, and I think, Mark, this can be a question to ask the, the panel because panel. it's such a, a, an important question mm. for, for villagers, like migration, as uh, Alan mentioned, or to access mm. universities, uh, mm. young living, yeah. brain drain. Mm -hmm. So Maria, Christina, Clive, Enrique, do you have solutions? Respond. Let's deal with the university uh, access one first, perhaps, and see. Yes. Uh, yes any yes. any examples from your and uh, Clive? Are you going to raise your hand? Yeah, I mean, one one way that it's being done in Lorme. I mean, the the that 
the main digital hub there uh, is now used as a center for MOOCs. And this is, um, I mean, it's, it's a training center in its own right, but it's also used as an access point for the university courses. But more than anything there, it's about building an education community, particularly young people. I mean, it, it's not about studying in isolation. It's about studying as a group. And this has really been shown to be very effective. So it delivers training on site and it also is a space where people can access also because it has an extraordinary um, internet connection. So mm. that, that, that's one way. It's a space where you want to go to learn, whether it's directly or whether it's actually using, using a, uh, via MOOCs. Mm -hmm. so that's a good okay. example. Thanks. But we are open up for a university. We have now five universities connected to this and they use the digital twin to look into it. So they commonly have this ground mm. to work in projects together and look on each other projects. And we open up data to participate. You have to open up the data. Mm. Yeah, you've given them a playground, haven't you? A sort of a, an area where they can come and test and, and exploit. So that's, uh, you know, you're, you're an, uh, attracting uh as opposed to waiting for them to kindly open a, uh, uh, a outpost. I mean, it used to be the trend in the, uh, the 1990s that every medium-sized city wanted to have an outpost of the regional university. So you had to wait to build this. But uh, now, they, they, from what you're saying, Jan, they're coming to you to, uh, to exploit your uh, knowledge. Interesting. Just one little point in relation to that, the University of Burgundy Franche Comte is actually now has a, an autonomous vehicle simulator, which they're the first ones to actually be looking in within the Nieva actually at uh, simulations in rural areas, particularly for elderly people, because they say it's simply not being done here. This is the first time it's been done because the conditions are very similar. And again, I think this university link is very important. Mm -hmm. You are giving them a playground, but also with real needs and solutions. Mm -hmm. En Enrique, I mean, we, uh, the Interreg Europe community, we have our database of good practices. And uh, I'm, I'm not sure if I typed in, uh, you know, rural and education, what we'd find, uh, or what uh, lessons from the ER ENRD uh, network on this education, the rural dimension, can you share? Um, I, I'd like to share my personal one. I mean, it was not... It's a free world. It's a free world. In <laughs> it was not really linked to some specific work we, we have yeah. done, but uh, I mean, I, I've been in a, in a local community, in a local action group, uh, in an area that is suffering strongly from rural depopulation. And actually, I found very interesting some, some of the learnings they have. First of all, uh, I mean, each, each territory is completely different. Right, so th there is no one magic uh, uh, key that helps every every area for for that. But first, what they tend to do is to uh, develop opportunities for the for certain parts of the young people that are in the area to replace existing jobs and make them attractive for them. But on the other hand, they also want to promote some young people to go. But then once they're gone, what they're, what they're going to do is to understand that big community that, that they have already gone in, in other places and understand, okay, what would make them come back right. to the area? Exactly. Mm -hmm. So they see a value of letting people go, experience, traveling, mm -hmm. see certain things. And what they're finding out is like people appreciate, young people appreciate much more their home, their initial home, their territory. They, they have the will to come back. And, and of course, in territory, probably the communities and the young people have different needs. But in this case, what they were thinking is like, now I could work uh, on my current job, I'm a self-employed or whatever, from, from, from my, my hometown. The difficulty is like, you know, uh, you don't have uh, availability of housing or, or, or any other, you know, slow with Wi-Fi. Or, but you need to understand what is your community out there, the young ones that left 10 years ago, what do they need to come back? So they're, they're doing the two approaches, like one, encouraging the generational renewal of the existing economic sectors in the area, trying to trying to boost new ones as well there, but at, at the same time, encourage young ones to go out but understand their needs that will make them come back to, to the area. And those needs will depend very much from territory to territory. Okay, thanks. Maria Cristina, in, in, in your experience, you know, 
knowledge more of the agricultural sector um, you know we see uh, greater mechanization greater use of you know tractors are now smarter than they've ever been they they drive themselves uh, do we do you see this sort of new training and, and skills needs in, in the rural uh, agricultural uh, uh, you know domain that could be a, an opportunity for a new 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 uh, you know implants of training institutes in the rural areas it seems that there is a big need about uh, about skills in rural areas, not mm -hmm. only for farmers, uh, mm -hmm. but also for people uh, living in these areas. Mm -hmm. Regarding the farmers, um, in the new CAP uh, strategic plans, um, uh, one of the of the cross-cutting objective is uh, to put uh, farmers, mm -hmm. uh, advisory services, experts on agriculture. Uh, to, to work together uh, uh, to, to learn new things, including uh, to, to obtain uh, uh, skills like uh, uh, um, uh, uh, techniques to bet, uh, relate to the precision farming, etc. So I think that it is a new era uh, with digitalization, mm. and, and everybody needs to update uh, the skill sets, the skills, mm. and the knowledge. Uh, Mm -hmm. uh, mm. In the southwest of France, uh, near Toulouse, there's a big aerospace cluster, and it's surrounded by a, you know, a rural community and an agricultural cluster. And they've crossed their knowledges and their communities to create a project called you know, Stars in the, in, the, in the Fields. And to try and say using satellite data, using satellite, and Jan, you were talking about the availability of data. You know, uh, you know whether it's the 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 number of uh, uh, grams of uh, pesticide per hectare that are used, and we can image that from space. So bringing literally, you know, space technology into the farmyard, uh, which is I think. I, I think that there for the moment I'm not spe specialist in agriculture. I'm mm. specialist uh, in rural development. Mm. For the moment, I, I think that there is a big discussion about the precision farming, mm. the, the smart farming. Smart farming, yeah. Uh, and the farmers, uh, they need to be updated. <coughs> huh? mm. If you take into account that the majority of farmers are not so young, uh, there is also a gap mm. to, to cover. Mm. Of course, I do, uh, there are some, as far as I know, there are some initiatives of uh, uh, innovation hubs in, uh, in in rural areas, huh? yeah. mm. and, and they are they try to, to 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 get together the population and see which kind of uh, of needs they are uh, in order to be connected mm. even in some institutes uh, or or in universities. Mm. But I, I will agree with Enrique that the, the the big question is the young people, huh? because the young people are, they would like. Uh, to go and to discover uh, the world. So there is an age that it's difficult <coughs> in the rural communities. Yeah. Yes, just, I, I want to add something on that. Um, there is this great map of Scandinavia done by Nord Regio, and they look at migration from young people. So 2029, and you see like they you know, rural areas, they lose a lot of people and they go, the young people, they go to, to more urban areas. But when you look at the age between 30 to 39, you see people coming back. So you see this uh, positive migration into uh, rural uh, areas. And I think this is the, the catch here. So not the very young, maybe let the, the very young go educated and then, you know, try help them to, to come back. And we've seen in one of our, um, uh, online discussion looking at spaces for innovation that having specific spaces uh, in rural areas to bring remote workers, hybrid workers, um, uh, you know, is really important for them and to, to, to come back into those uh, more like rural spaces. Yeah, one of the, the discussion comments was saying, yes, young people, but let's also remember the sort of the, the gender issue. And, and I think, we, we, you know, the sort of role of women in, in rural communities uh, as being often the sort of the glue that holds communities together because of their different networking, their different, uh, you know, responsibilities. Uh, 
So I think that's a, a, another dimension. Uh, do any of our speakers today have any particular views on on the sort of the gender issue, the role of uh, women in, in the smart village uh, dimension we've been discussing? Well, from uh, our uh, Bevrad, we, we have mostly women, girls, mm. and uh, something like 90%. Uh, I think they are more engaging in, in the social uh, development, I think. Okay, interesting. Mm -hmm. And we, we saw Clive, you're recruiting 90 year olds to do your videos. So <laughs> you're definitely using the knowledge of women. Absolutely, absolutely. She's, a, she's a, an extraordinary ambassador for yeah, she's, she's, the, the involvement. And I think it shows you that what, whatever age and particularly on the gender side. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And interestingly, there's some strategies now relating to particularly rural work hubs where they're targeting women. And I think there's, I can't, I can't remember which hubs they were now, but it's, it's d deliberately because one, they're attracting families mm. very often. And interestingly, the, the best ever study done on, a, let's say, a smart village, um, mm. which has been in existence for some time, was done in the Massif Central in France. And they, set, and they show that 60% of the women, what they called e-entrepreneurs, some of the e-entrepreneurs who arrived were women, the 60%. Mm. And and this this was this started back in two thousand and eight. So I think what they're really showing is that you need to focus on, on on women, and it's it's not just about getting a load of techies to come in and you know do their digital nomad stuff for a few weeks. It's about getting families to settle and to stay there permanently and really add value to the community, including kids. Because one thing they've showed, if you bring families in, you help to keep rural <coughs> schools alive and you can help to keep rural services. Mm -hmm. So it's really targeting the whole package. It's not just about getting some remote programmers to come in and space yeah. in, in your community for a few weeks. Mm -hmm. well, well, thanks for those, those in, insights. I think you're, you're right about the package and Arno highlighted the sort of migration trend of making sure when families come back, they do have the schools and they have higher education and not just simply uh, the uh, primary level. Mm -hmm. okay. I see. Enrique, you have your hands raised. Yes, I, I wanted to come back on this issue on the, the gender dimension. I mean, uh -huh. we, we in Aidel, which is the Association on Innovation and Local Development, for which I'm, I'm, I'm part of as well, uh, we are going to be involved in a project on woman-led innovation in rural areas and the farming sector. And, and some of the lessons that so far we are uh, we are aware of uh, is that uh, women in rural areas have difficulties to really engage first in the farming sector and in, in fact in some countries they participate in farming but this is not really recognized and they have to really work at policy level for that uh, and, and second is that uh, in many rural areas women are kind of household holders uh, taking uh, a lot of non-unpaid responsibilities in terms of taking care of the family, the elder in the area and so on. And, and, and that prevents them from participating in many of the uh, business and innovation activities that they could run. And in fact, what we have observed is that when, when uh, these conditions are met and they can fully dedicate to, 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 to create new businesses, think about the innovative idea, they are really brilliant. Uh, and there is a lot of potential there. Uh, so there are many different elements to be tackled. It's not just about one. Uh, we, we, you mm. need to think about the whole ecosystem around the woman to support them so that they, you can enable them to participate as well uh, in, the, in the economic activities of the area. All right. While you're, while you're online there, Enrique, one of the questions I think mm. Maria Eugenie uh, Altamir just sent in was saying how the you know, incomers, uh, whether they are families coming back who are returning with different skills and, and social values, or the expats, uh, I'm sure you know what that expression means, create social uh, friction, social challenges. And, and I highlighted that earlier when I said the housing market is often blamed on incomers coming in, buying up rural properties and pricing local. Uh, um, uh, any experiences on, on dealing with this social uh, friction? Yeah, short, and then we, we have to close. Yeah, Arnaud's got TikTok, TikTok really, on us. Really quick on, on Lom, mm. 
Mm. If you if you look at a village like Long, where in fact there's a lot of old housing stock, mm. there's not really a problem. They're really trying to get people back in. Mm. Where I live in the Alps, it is an enormous problem mm. because there the house prices have gone up by 60 to 70 percent. It depends where you are. Lomes is far more remote. They need more people to come back, mm. and there's a lot of housing stock. In other areas, it's a real issue, and that's something that can really only be tackled by mm. the by community organisations or by local government. It really depends where you are. Yeah, and a quick, you know, you're going to integrate another 1,200 households, or was it something like that? I wrote it down. That is correct. Yeah. About yeah. 50% increase. Yeah, so will that, is that planned uh, integration? Uh, that, that is the plan of the municipality. Mm. Uh, if that goes like that, we don't know yet. Mm. Uh, we, we are eager to keep the village feeling, and we have compared to uh, villages with that uh, number of people and there are less village feeling there. So that is how to keep village feeling even if we grow. Mm. Mm. All right, let's, let's come on from Maria, Christina, and if you have any, and then we, we close this webinar. So, yes. <laughs> no. I, I, I could say that uh, smart village uh, is, a, is, a, is a continuous process. Huh? Today we, we, have, we, we have had uh, two very uh, uh, interesting uh, uh, projects, uh, but I think that it took time to arrive to, and to accomplish all these projects. So uh, two things, uh, local engagement, passions, uh, in this process, maybe there are failures, mm. uh, there are success, but if, uh, if the objective uh, is clear, I, I think uh, that all together we can succeed. Mm. Thank you, Maria Christina. A few uh, insights uh, from our side. Um, so as Enrique mentions, rural areas and, and smart villages can really be test beds to respond to complex social uh, grand challenges within like with the food, the energy crisis, bottom up processes, super important, but also top down ap approaches coming from the European Commission, for instance, giving these uh, directionalities, integrated strategies, super important, uh, as we've seen with uh, Clive and, and Ian having multiple initiatives to address complex uh, policy challenges. And lastly, as mentioned, Maria Cristina, identifying the chain, change agents, the agents of change to foster bottom-up community involvement uh, is really important, important as well. So to everyone, thank you very much to uh, our speakers uh, for being here. We will write a, a very short uh, follow-up uh, article with all the insights and the presentation and everything. Also, we have a poll for the audience to know if you're interested in one of our services to uh, receive uh, expert support and a peer review or matchmaking sessions. So if you say yes and yes, we will contact you with more information on the peer review and on uh, matchmakings, and we will uh, stay in contact with you. And I'm saying yes and yes as well. I didn't know if we were allowed to vote, Arnaud, because we were oh, biased. Oh, oh, no, we cannot vote. <laughs> yes, otherwise I would have said yes. It's well, a great, great service. Yeah, while people are voting, I think I would just add one remark. We heard it in the second part of our discussion, the way in which you engage with some of the key stakeholders who can be accelerators, whether it's youth, whether it's the uh, you know uh, female uh, members, the gender community, whatever, finding those accelerators can then fit into what uh, Enrique said about having this holistic strategy. You've got to deal with all the elements, but sometimes you can accelerate some with some, you know, parts of your community and stakeholders. We're only three minutes less, uh, um, late. So late, yes. So thank you very much to all of our speakers, uh, Maya Kisina, Clive, Enrique and Jan and Mark, and also Lotte for being here. And Arno. And and me, of course. Uh, thank you so much. Thanks for the audience for great questions. Mm -hmm. And until until next time. Thank you very much. Thank you. And and bye bye. Bye bye everyone. Bye bye.